Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 235. That's dos, tres, cinco. How are you doing, my listeners? How are you doing, my friends? Great. I'm glad you're okay. Myself? I'm feeling amazing. Feeling great, man. Even though I did two workouts in a day yesterday, um, my double workout day is going to be Monday and Friday. I've mentioned to you in my previous podcast. I'm feeling a little bit tired, a little bit run down. I've got my coffee in hand here, right? Um, I'm going to drink this. I've had my breakfast already. Got to drink this, do my podcast, head off to work, and I'll be ready to go. Ready to go at the top of my performance levels, be able to perform as much as I can in my employment and come back and charge again because that's what matters in life. But yeah, um, I'm feeling a bit run down, man. Doing two workouts in a day isn't easy. Even though both of them weren't that long, right? I went to the gym for like half an hour, 40 minutes and did some weight training. And then I went and ran for about, I did a little 5K after in the evening. It's a bit hard. And then today I might do the same thing again. Difficult, don't get me wrong, but I feel good, man. I feel like, um, I feel in a good zone. I feel very sprightly. I feel like I should um, do something else. And I probably might do something else in my um in my sober October month of a challenge. Maybe I might even end up doing some Muay Thai, some Jiu Jitsu or something. I don't know. Something else I want to do. But you know what I'm actually thinking of doing for this um sober October stuff? Because the sober October plan for this year or sober October three, sober October two thousand nineteen, the plan that all the Joe Rogan guys are doing is that they're trying to do something new, like a new skill or a new hobby or a new just something new that they haven't done beforehand. Um in this month of October. I think they've done they've done some tactical shooting Bert Crash did some spear fishing. Um, did, he did some dance prior. So I'm thinking of doing stand up comedy because I really, really want to do it. Um, I've kind of been told I should do it. I think I could do it. Um, I kind of, again, it's probably hard to rate yourself and say you're funny because unless you go on stage and make strangers laugh, you're probably not funny. In the same way that, you know, unless you go and DJ in a place where no one knows you to make them dance, you're probably not a real DJ right um in the same way like you know if if other people apart from your mom tell you you're a good singer then probably you're not a good singer so there's a, there's a part of me that's thinking hmm this probably might be a big fail this probably might be one of those things where like you know you know you meet people who are like conversationally funny i might be that kind of person but whether or not i'll be funny on stage telling jokes or telling my you know putting a, a kind of funny spin on my experiences through life especially living as an ic free male in this um what do you call it tough environment that I'm, I'm situated now right next to the heart of westfield shopping center you know where you know there's a, an abundance of shop of shops next to me that i can go and peruse in i've grown up in a very very tough neighborhood you know um, two parents in the household you know tons of brothers and cousins and sisters and all that sort of shit um in my family loads of family familiar support a nice friendship circle my life has been very very tough so maybe those examples won't resonate that well on the stage, but hopefully they will. You never know. Um, I just want to give it a go, man. Again, no expectations, no real plan in terms of what I want to do going forward with it. Just want to give it a go and see how it is. Um, just kind of at least tell myself I've done it, right? Same with Muay Thai. I did Muay Thai. At least I know how I've done it. At least I know I can do it. So going forward, it's probably going to be something that I'm going to probably do some, some way, shape, or yeah. But there's one on Tuesdays. I think it's a comedy car crash in Soho every tuesday but again i think i want to spend a week writing jokes probably from today on to next tuesday and then hopefully go there and see if i can do it man yeah i want to yeah i want to go next tuesday fuck it i'll go next tuesday and i'll report back to you guys about what 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 occurred when i went there and next tuesday will be what let me look at my calendar here next tuesday will be the 22nd so i want to do my podcast on the 23rd of wednesday on the 23rd that's a wednesday i'll let you guys know how i got on and what i thought of the whole event but i'm definitely going to do it i think i'm going to I'm, I'm going to get involved fuck it man i need to do something at least um, i need to um yeah i need to try it out man I need to try it out life is about experiencing things and trying out new things i think this might be a good event for me to do going forward who knows um apart from that how else have you guys been doing all right good 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 okay awesome i've got loads of topics to run through today like I mentioned, um, tough working week this week. Lots of deadlines coming up. So let's just run through these topics and then we can go on to our merry, merry way. Let's see. Oh, coffee is nice, isn't it, in the morning? Yeah, it's nice to have a little, little bit of a coffee in the morning. So loads of topics to run through. Let's get on in and dive on into the subjects we have here. 
so many, so many things to go through. Ba 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 ba. Boiler room. I talked about already. Okay, cool, awesome. So there's um a really cool article here I've got from the Guardian, right? Um, the Guardian produced a really cool article or review of these exhibitions happening at the same time, kind of focused on um nightclubs and club culture, especially within a creative um realm. It's uh written by a lady called Hetty Judah, who I'm, I'm familiar with from her appearances on Show Studio. She's done a few other stuff with the BBC. Um, you know. A very influential critique of some sorts, right? Is that that's what Hattie Judas um, occupation is? I'm assuming. Let me see, let us see if we can find her on the old um, on the old Wikipedia. What's her what's her thing? So on Wikipedia, it titles that hey, Teddy Judas is an author. She's a British author who has written um, extensively about fashion, art, and design for various international publications. Recent books that she has edited include Pattern One Hundred Fashion Designers and Ten Curators and Art of art and design there's a couple of her books here she's got emerald 20 century fashion book mark quinn on display so yeah a very influential person and she wrote this cool, pretty cool article here um from the guardian titled glamour decadence raids and scandal arts greatest nightclubs and it kind of um read kind of um encapsulates all the different movements that happened you know for them for the most part that was kind of depicted within nightclubs creative movements and it's also kind of uh, an expose or uh a little piece that kind of details this exhibition ha currently happening at the Barbican, which kind of focuses on the importance of um, creative kind of subcultures and night spots on night culture. And there's a bit on here that really kind of resonated with me and stuck out to me that I kind of want to read out to you. It's a really long article, but I reckon I'm going to put in the show notes for you guys to check out if you want to read it yourself. It's called Glamour and Decadence, Raids and Scandal, Art's Greatest Night Clubs on The Guardian. Um, there's a bit here that really kind of resonated with me, right? Um, number one, there's a bit here about this really cool art. So let's probably start at the top. Where, where is this? About this Anita Berber. She's really, really cool artist that was very influential back in the day. Yeah, so there's a really cool bit here about this woman called Anita Berber, who I've kind of now been obsessed with. And I, I went online and kind of uh, put a couple of her books or a couple of books that depicted her lifestyle and her life within my Amazon wish list. It says the following. In Berlin, meanwhile, um, Otto Dix was among the many um, entranced by dancer Anita Berber, whose heavy makeup, including a heavy heart-shaped uh, dub of um, lipstick over her white out lips, was crowned with a heavy fringe and fiery hair. Thus adorned with the addition of a diamond in her navel, Berber took to the stage on the Wise Miss Cabaret. Her clingy red dress and Dix's magnificent 1925 portrait, which you can see here, which is pretty cool, right? So it's an amazing portrait. Just Im imagine, imagine, imagine seeing someone like this in 1925s, right? How I'm in 1925, how amazing she would have looked. Such this is um the pinnacle of like being yourself, right? In a society that was very conformist, everyone kind of had a a very um what you call it, a similar way of dressing, and then you see this amazing performance artist with a diamond in her navel right in her belly button in this amazing slinky red dress that looks like something that you would see maybe out of a burg out of a, like a balenciaga fashion show right something quite similar to what they did red hair um heart shape on her lipstick like just amazing i mean it continues here the article a uh, clingy red dress and dick's magnificent 1925 portrait is modest by comparison hooked on morphine opium and cocaine berber died before she was 30 having portrayed extremes of contemporary life including sex work and drug addictions on a stage and it kind of re resonated with me because i've always remembered that in each kind of subculture in each kind of nightlife nightclub sort of experience i've had for the most part there was always those kind of characters that existed who were kind of big larger than life characters who unfortunately let the drugs and the alcoholism kind of get to them and they kind of fell by the wayside or, or sometimes in some cases died but they, their legendary status lived it kind of reverberated around, amongst the scene right and people were able to take for instance, like you wouldn't necessarily live such a decadent lifestyle as Anita Berber, you wouldn't go that far, but you take some of her fearlessness, some of her courage, uh, some of her forward thinking, and apply it into your practice. So there was examples that were, you know, these phoenixes that kind of burned out into the sun, or burned out into oblivion themselves, or burned themselves out. But then you could take the lessons learned, or the practices they kind of um, imbued in their practice, and adopt them in yours. And that was kind of what they can. That's the purpose they sort of served in a really macabre sort of way. They were never. You look at someone like a Lee Bowery and the fact that how influential someone like a Lee Bowery is to so many new generation of artists and designers coming up nowadays. And you sometimes think to yourself, like, was that Lee Bowery's purpose in life? Was that the reason why someone like him or Steve McQueen or sorry, uh, yeah, um, was around, right? Was because they was set, they, the purpose they served was to kind of just be an example and set kind of, there are some examples where they're still alive, like, a, you know, Helmut Lang and a Marcel, um, what do you call it? Um, Maison Martin Margiela, sorry, 
people like that of that ilk who are still around nowadays where i think to myself maybe they recognize their purpose and the the kind of uh, place they had within the creative timeline that they're kind of existing on they were part, they were meant to be there for a short period of time influence a whole generation of people and then kind of disappear they were meant to keep going on and on and on and probably that's where that's where real bravery and real courage in your artwork really comes in or your your creativity comes i think in that regard of kind of understanding when to stop when to kind of you when when to when to when to declare you've said enough um, there are occasions when you don't have to the, you don't say enough and you just want to kind of die on your easel or you want to die on the dance floor you want to just keep going until you know until the walls fall off but there is a point where some artists kind of are able to reflect and see you know what my influence has probably outlived or has probably out it's probably outsized my body of work and maybe it's contributing to my body of work so maybe i should just leave it for what it is instead of kind of st- uh, tainting it and kind of destroying my legacy and just let it be what it was in the past right similar to kind of like i think about this is a, probably a bad example but bape is a good example of it right since nigo left and since most of the original design team has it looks like i've left because i think when nigo left or when nigo um kind of sold uh bape to the it group it felt as if like there was a p- couple of seasons of or maybe a few seasons after the fact when the news broke that bape was still hanging around pretty well right they were still putting out some decent collections so it kind of led me to think that maybe some of the design team that was with that was with Nigo since the beginning hanged around for a bit, right? And then obviously over time, when you get absorbed by another company, you see it happening with startups all the time, right? Especially look at the Instagram founders, right? They've basically both of them have left, haven't they? Alex and Sistrom and the other guy, right? I think so. Both of them have left. Kevin Sistrom, sorry. It's pretty hard to stay on at the company that you built up when you got absorbed by another company, right? They kind of bring in different people. They have a different sort of vision. They're essentially your boss. You're essentially working for them. And if you've decided to kind of go on this path of creating your own little lane and creating your own little brand, the last thing you want is to have a boss again. So it felt as if like maybe two or three seasons in, the same designers who are kind of working for Nego, this kind of, you know, ephemeral, once in a generation talent, kind of got tired of working with the IT group and left. And then the IT group went ahead and kind of hired their own sort of like freelance designers or they kind of... um what you call it gave their seasons away because i'm sure that happens it's to some big brands right where they just enlist um kind of ghost designers to kind of design collections maybe three or four in a, in advance maybe as a contract you know you have six seasons and you just design a whole kind of course quote unquote long-term capsule a long term sort of capsule design um a long-term sorry collection that you kind of put out so i think maybe that's what maybe happened with bape but you look at it and you're like was it worth it to just kind of i'm sure in it group they're kind of printing money with the t-shirts and hoodies they make but for the most part the people like me that used to buy bait back in the day and the people who have an appreciation for the brand in general aren't necessarily going to buy a puma collaboration you know jacket right they're not going to buy that sort of shit so you're counting on kids nowadays to have an affinity with bait when it's not when it's not even cutting it it's not even at the same level as some of the brands we have nowadays that are just really going for it going for broke for instance like a stussy and a babe the, the, in terms of what they're designing in terms of the quality in terms of the appeal in terms of um the cool factor is just worlds apart in it and you wouldn't have said that like a few seasons ago um so that's probably one of the um things that you can, i probably think about a lot is like you know when is there when is it a good time to stop and to say to yourself you know what my influence is far outlived anything i could create now or in this kind of generation i'm just going to stop and let my legacy kind of speak for itself and allow just kind of read the rewards of it do a couple of talks design some collaborations on undercover and stuff like just be uh, on the raid just be low and just be allowing yourself to be allow yourself to kind of be patronage in that regard right people going to be giving you money to kind of create and to kind of stay around and just be the creative force you are because they've gained, they've gleaned so much value from you over the years um but yeah that anita berber character sounds fucking awesome and then um got scrolling down on the rest of this article there's another bit here that really kind of resonated with me as well da, 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 da. where is it in china as often as figures commit to canvas, where is it? Da, da, da. Yeah, so here's a bit that really resonated with me, right? There's a quote here. There's a bit here that um Hedy Judah wrote that I thought was really cool. Uh, as so often, the figures commit, um, commit, uh, committed to uh, canvas were female, those wielding the paintbrush male, and it's artists who tend to be remembered, not the performers who thrilled them. Um, Austin Ostende argues. Uh, for these avant-garde des- uh, dancers and cabaret artists to be afforded their proper due, but what is a club without people? What secured these night spots as a place in art history was not the great cocktails, it was a clientele that curious combination of right place, right time. Creative work can be isolating. Clubs are where the individual creative act can become part of something bigger. In these bohemian haunts, the distinction between performer and audience was flexible, the experience was fe- theatrical, everyone was part of the scene, which is essentially what 
I kind of gleaned or I kind of got from those years spent in Shoreditch, spent in Dawson, spent in Stoke Newton, spent in Peckham, spent in New Cross, um, spent during the warehouse kind of um, party kind of um, surge in Hackney Wick and stuff. Those are some of the things I kind of got from it, right? All the kind of forest raves. They essentially made me who I am and kind of crafted and honed some of my interests. The first time I went to Berlin, the time I went to Frankfurt, all these trips were instrumental in kind of allowing me... Um, uh, a route in right understanding where my place was what i could do how i could contribute because the first thing that happens when you get a, a, when you get exposed to a scene is that the first thing it does to you it kind of humanizes everyone there's there is no lionization of people right because you meet them um at events like for instance like you know the amount of events i went to during the early 2000s where you bumped into the xx at got at our gallery events and parties and stuff it kind of humanized them you got to realize that they were just they were like you right they were, they were everyday people like you you actually know, you jamie xx playing in like a dirty basement bar somewhere you can just touch and feel him and talk to him it's like a normal person it kind of stops lionizing him even though he's an incredibly talented musician you just see him as a dude who kind of really passionate about the music and puts it out right on a consistent basis and if you then if you have aspirations to be the same in the same sort of conversation it kind of makes it um it kind of makes that dream achievable because you can see him right in front of you whereas i guess if you're you know idolizing hollywood stars like brad pitt and John, tom cruise they're kind of way 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 th th there is no way of kind of communicating with them personally and there is no way of understanding where you fall in the kind of totem pole right in terms of um talent or in terms of ability in terms of position there is no way of understanding where your position is going to be in, the, in that kind of arena or that kind of realm but when you're in a kind of dirty kind of old blue east um is it all blue is it all blue all blue east that pub in shoreditch those kind of areas and you bump into these kind of people it makes things just normal it makes it achievable right and part of the reason why as well is so cool is that there's the variety of people that you meet in these scenes right that's what me made it really incredible to kind of hang around there you meet people from all different age groups from all different backgrounds from all different um career trajectories or uh, career um fields whatever it may be right or job applications and it kind of makes that whole scene more vibrant and i guess that's that was probably the demise of the south sort of the east london scene and then the uprising of the south london scene i think east for the most part when it's when it started to become just like young kids um uh, you know they're um, kind of getting absorbed to kind of yeah mostly young kids in the scene and not really a, a good variety of young kids everyone kind of from the same sort of background everyone kind of fighting for the same sort of roles stylist fashion director photographer um manager crave director it kind of got a bit stale then south popped up more interesting because south was a great mix of people from actual different backgrounds right you got people that were you know graphic designers interior designers 10 years in five years in. you had people working in nine to five who just like the scene in general that's what made the scene the scene the moment it started to become the moment you started to feel as if like there were loads of people that looked like you in the scene that's when it started to die in the marriage period. but again i can't deny how influential it was to hang around those kind of places to be able to put on nights in some of these spaces like the alibi and all those kind of places it really informed who i am as a person and again i really i'd, I'd, I'd really kind of connect this piece that hits you to a rip because i do i do kind of i'm sympathize with the idea that you know as much of an extrovert as i kind of come across or as i probably am in real life there is a part of me also that's very introverted right this idea of this podcast sitting here in front of this camera in front of this microphone talking to an audience of how many people and just doing it on my own and not trying to get guests in and just kind of just honing my craft and reading books and doing mixes and running a lot and drawing and writing these are all things that are very solitary right they, they don't really involve other people and I get a lot of comfort. I get a lot of enjoyment from it, right? I get a lot of enjoyment from going to Berlin on my own, right? And just kind of deciding to go because I don't have to check in with somebody and figure out a plan and figure out where we want to go and where we want to stay. I can just book a ticket and just kind of go on my own, right? And just figure it out in the end. And um, obviously meet people on the other side, but I can just figure it out as I go um, on my own to onto this trip. Those are amazing, but there is a part of you that kind of longs for that connection with people that are the same as you, right? They're, they're in the same sort of field, the same sort of have same sort of levels, same sort of interest as you. And the only way to do that is to go to usually bars and clubs, right? Um, especially, I say this article is a good uh, distinction between it, night spots, right? They're not exactly nightclubs and not exactly bars. There's they're sort of the in between. They're sort of the place where like if there's a right, if there's a right group of people in there at that particular time, they're going to, you know, keep it you're gonna have a lock-in right and you're gonna stay down to the early hours in the morning um you get friendly with the bartenders you get friendly with the bar manager you get friendly with the bouncers you just get friendly everyone in the scene and it becomes like um your home away from home and those places are where you kind of get to connect to people that are in the same sort of 
filled as you you maybe get to collaborate on projects make new friends it's just um just a really great way to kind of go about your creative life i think overall and i'm a big fan of it honestly i'm really a really big fan of it i think nowadays i'd hope kids maybe kids have the advantage of having facebook groups and stuff because i know places like the basement have done a good job with that right kids there for a real affinity with the people that they're talking to then we do meetups i've seen loads the amount of posts i've seen on the basement where somebody has kind of lost their train ticket or got chucked off a train and people have kind of contributed to them get, getting home on time have been awesome but i would like to see more of a return to kids kind of going out and actually meeting people and actually building an actual scene because i think that would that is where new subcultures will kind of breed and kind of come from you hear a lot of people especially older people saying oh there's no sub no subcultures no subcultures maybe because the kids just saw the internet their subcultures are on the internet but it would be cool to see subcultures existing in the irl right in real life where kids are able to kind of communicate kind of link up uh, build and collaborate uh, and just kind of talk right in real life about things that are interesting because I, I i remember even just the first couple of times i met people on sneaker forums in real life the amount of joy and happiness you got from talking about trainers and sneakers in real life with somebody ha hearing them joke about a particular sneaker or this the thing that you're wearing that you're so captivated by just to kind of to bring it to life the jokey nature of it it's just i don't know i didn't have an element to it the same could be said for techno music, right? Like you could be into techno as much as you want, but bumping into somebody who likes the same DJ as much as you or same club night or has listened to the same releases or went to the same nightclub that you did or had the same reference points, just fucking, it blows your mind, but you just start standing there like wanking each other off, innit? <laughs> like no homo or maybe some homo, I don't know. But I love it, man. I love it. And I've and I've, I've gained so much from it. I, I honestly have gained so much from it. And I, and I don't really know where I'd be without night spots and nightclub culture. Which is why I'm a huge fan of nightlife, man. And I'm hoping that over the next few years, we'll see a kind of resurgence of the whole nightlife culture. Maybe with this um, newer night czar we have at the moment, this Amy Lammy woman will be able to pull her finger out and be able to kind of enact some change or kind of help us out in that regard so we don't lose these spots. Because I think it seems as if like late, lately anyway, for the most part, especially in East London, um, there has been a, there has been more of a concentrated effort to kind of change. I think they mentioned it actually in the in the report that they put through for Hackney Council, that they went to make Hackney more so in the image of Stoke Newington, right? So um, they went to make it more about bars and restaurants as opposed to nightclubs, right? And cocktail bars and stuff, which is, you know, f fair enough. But we have to have some places left and reserved for the freaks, for the weirdos to go out at night and kind of congregate. They have to exist because that's what feeds back into the creativity. That's what feeds back into the work that's produced. That's what feeds back into the great architecture, the great interior design, just a great kind of, you know, um, ambiance of a neighborhood. That's what makes it interesting, right? If I did that, you have like, you know, a charity shop next to a bakery, next to a coffee shop, next to this really weird debauchery sort of night spot that only opens up at 11 on particular sort of days. You have to knock a certain time. That's what makes the area interesting. When you have the same, you have the same kind of, you know, 10 pound avocado and toast breakfast spots opening up in the same places, it doesn't really give the place any sort of juice, any sort of, you know, spark or juice. It just makes it a bit stale. You need some other things to kind of mix it up. You need some debauchery, some sort of, you know, some underhanded underground culture stuff to kind of make it more exciting. And hopefully we see that happening in the future going forward. But yeah, this article is really cool. I recommend you check it out by Hetty Judah. Um, it's kind of depicting an, uh, uh, an exhibition that's happening very soon. Scroll by to give you an example of it. Loads of really cool artworks about, um, you know, cabaret dancers back in the day and shit. But I recommend you check it out. It's for an exhibition that's happening now. The exhibition is called Into the Night, Cabarets and Clubs in Modern Art Barbican, at the Barbican Gallery. It's until the 19th of January. It's loads of time. So check it out. I really recommend you check it out. And there's a lot of other exhibitions actually mentioned in this article too to check out too, based on art culture that I'm going to probably end up going to and i'm probably going to do a review of those actually when i i end up attending these um gallery exhibitions sometime very soon so keep an eye out for that i'll do a little review of the exhibition when i go there so uh next on the list here what do we have we have we have we have we have we have um an article that i'm sure some of you will not be surprised about this article i stumbled upon recently on social media supposedly london is the home of cocaine who knew who knew <laughs> this article is from the evening standard it's really funny because it just made me laugh it's like you know so you know some of those articles you see online it's like oh um i remember the other day i was in a barber shop and um getting my hair cut of course as you can see nice and trim i was in a barber shop and uh one of those kind of you know stories came up on sky news about like oh research shows that walking can stave off the effects of cancer right or whatever maybe yeah and i think people were making some jokes and i was like oh yeah no wonder that's um 
no wonder why crackheads walk around so much, right? And everyone's like laughing. I was like, yeah, because you've never, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen an overweight crackhead. That's why walking is so important. You have to walk everywhere. So those kind of reports come out. Yeah, there's kind of walk, there's kind of obvious um, Larry, you know, kind of um, reports. But this one is kind of interesting because if you've been to, if you've been to any sort of like night spot in Shoreditch, in Old Street, in Dawson, you would have known that there has been a real big spike, I think, in general. Not just, I think there was a time when cocaine was reserved for a particular, let's say, middle class or working class kind of white people for the most part. But I think in the last maybe 10 or 5 years or 5 to 10 years, it seems as if everyone that's kind of like working within the kind of middle, um, let's say, say mid-level executive kind of from up uh, and upwards, right, who's able to kind of afford it, who maybe has, let's say, after paying rent, they have maybe 900 quid to a thousand pounds left over for them to spend during the month are, you know, for the most part, when they go recreational drug taking, they're not doing weed. They're not doing pills. They go straight to cocaine. Um, that's a big, big thing. You you see loads of groups of people going and buying coke together as friends and splitting it together. There was a really cool little video actually recently about this dude who kind of deals only to kind of high flying professionals and kind of deals them coke and they go meet up at his house and da da da. So it's a real big thing happening at the moment. Um, again, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's because in general we've been overworked in London. I feel as if all of my friends, even the people working low level jobs, even to mid level jobs, there is no separate. It's still as if yeah, you know what I'm thinking about it. There is no separation between the three tiers, low, mid or high um, level executive jobs. I feel as if every, all of my friends, even my friends working in the bar backs, working on a retail shop floor, my friends working in office spaces, my friends w- that are working as managers of, an, of a customer service team, all of my friends are working in same numbers of hours. I don't think I've met anyone so far who has the benefit of just skiving off and leaving work at 4 p.m. Um, everyone's having to like come in really early, stay really late, sometimes answer emails on the weekends. There is no real, get, there is no real break in, t- in kind of, um, your working schedule you're always kind of on so maybe that reason if that that's probably one of the reasons why people are turning to stuff like cocaine because it kind of just takes you away from your everyday life right and there's only so much alcohol you can drink because i think in general we do the alcohol thing quite well i think if you're, if you're in office space you'll know that for the most part every friday you get given drinks and um, sometimes on birthday people get given cakes sometimes on birthdays people go out and buy, go to a bar and have a good time there there's always something happening right and that involves alcohol so there's only so much alcohol you can have at a certain time you're like you know what i'm off i'm over this sort of thing so the next thing to do the next common you know way to go if you're kind of in that kind of indulgency um um um, rabbit hole is to go down the cocaine route and um is london or for the most part as i've read in the book my book zero 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 by roberto saviano london is probably one of the best places to get it because this is where it kind of gets distributed the most for the most part, it comes in. It comes in via London, doesn't it? From from the south, and sometimes it comes in through Newcastle, and Liverpool. But yeah, big article here from the actually even Stan. Let's actually read this article first before I start divulging my own expertise on this actual issue here. Um, blah blah blah. So this article is from Living Stan. This is the following: London has snort twenty three um, kilograms of cocaine a day, twice as much as any other European city. How much is a how much is a brick of cocaine? How many? kg is a brick of cocaine i don't know how much is that how much is one brick of cocaine one brick of cocaine is what so we we, we people in london sniff what you know in in the in that what um his question how much is a one brick of cocaine hi that question is many possible answers due to the main different locations in the world um the the more you buy the cheaper it gets meaning if you if if one brick is 20k four bricks is 70k just an example so but how many grams is one brick I don't know. Okay, 1,000. How many grams is it? 1,000 or 10 or 108 grams. I don't know. Let's see. So I was watching the Between the KG, the Poet Philly, and one of the parts of the battle screech in my head. Go to the. Okay, so, okay, so, fair enough. We smoke, we sniff a lot, supposedly. So, anyway, let's go back to the article. So, it says 23 kg a day. So, Londoners are consuming more cocaine than any other European city has revealed. Now, honestly, this has to do with the working schedule. It can't be... If we're the only European city that works people to 40-hour minimums and uh, and up, right, and people are suffering from work um, from work-based depression, there's a lot of bullying sometimes in workplaces, and some jobs are hard to come by, so there's that kind of stress about getting one, and you finally get one, you're just trying your best not to lose it. Um, the fact that there's no much of a work-life balance, the fact that schools are so expensive, if you have kids, you want to put them through there, the fact that you want to... It's so hard to buy houses. There's a lot of barriers that kind of make the job thing really, really crucial. 
So maybe that's part of it. I don't know. But for the most part, the only people I see that really kind of enjoying their day to day work life balance or work in general are like market traders and stuff like right because they kind of make their own timetable or barbers and stuff like that. When I go there or restaurateurs that own their own restaurants, like they're they're kind of they're probably living the vida loca in that regard. Sometimes not all the time because I guess you know to make a restaurant work it, it requires a lot of work in that regard too. But those those are the places where I see it happening. Anyway, so the following. The capital's cocaine market is worth an estimated one uh, one billion a year, and about twenty three kg of pure cocaine is snorted a day, equivalent to uh, five hundred sixty seven four hundred doses. Or how do they know what how much of a dose of cocaine is? Fucking cheeky buggers. The quantity is twice that of any European capital, and more than taken in Barcelona, Amsterdam, and Berlin combined. Which is true because I've having been to Berlin and Amsterdam, sorry, B- Berlin and Barcelona. I know that they don't do as much cocaine as we do. For instance, like they are more experimental with their drugs. I think. In the UK, for the most part, we're quite boring. The only time I've seen people kind of doing different drugs or hearing, hearing people doing different drugs are kids that have come up, come, come down from Scotland. It's been a huge kind of um, surge of kids coming down from Scotland and kind of, you know, trying to make life here or trying to get some experience and take it back up to Scotland, wherever they go, maybe go back to their art universities. But they have a bit more of a... It feels as if everyone outside of London has a higher tolerance for other drugs except for cocaine because, you know, if you live in a small town in Scotland and you don't have much going on, you can't exactly, you know a couple of pills and some mdma or some coke isn't going to really get you fucked over because you know you're you, you, you're you're more you're more um what's that thing called you're more conditioned right there's more time for you to enjoy those things maybe in people's houses and stuff there's not i don't know everyone i've met so far has been has been has a higher tolerance level outside of london i don't know what it is maybe against small town thing maybe it's the fact that you know, you do it quite early in, 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 in age because you're bored and you have nothing to do. So you start doing drugs when you're 14, 13. I don't know. But it continues. Um, Again, like I said, they're more experimental in places like Berlin. Do other stuff apart from cocaine. We're here. It's just like, you know, most people are only doing cocaine and kept for the most reasons, right? But after, but the rate consumed per person is less than that of Bristol, which came up top. Rah, Bristol's top. Okay, interesting. Forensic uh, scientists um, analyze sewage water for levels of cocaine derivatives metabolized by the body. This is a very interesting study, right? The results revealed by Sky News show that cocaine usage increased by 30% at the weekend, which is, you know, again, a common thing you'd see. But I have seen a real big surge in people taking cocaine at work. I know a few people, or I've heard of a few stories of people, especially in professional environments, especially in very high profile, high pressured environments, who are taking cocaine to kind of, kind of get them through the days. Because, you know, sometimes. Have you ever walked past Liverpool Street Station or Liverpool Street or around that kind of area where the kind of financial buildings are and you've kind of seen lights on, right? And people seen working in the offices and stuff until like 9, 8 p.m. And then they're coming back um, to work in the morning really early at 8 again in the morning. So to kind of keep that kind of cycle going, there's only so much coffee that's going to really help you out. So you might have to take a couple of bumps here and there to keep you going. But I've seen that that's a really been a big trend happening so far. And again, it's quite depressing because in number one, the the city is hot, is expensive to live in hard to live in so you have to kind of you know battle all these kind of you know things to kind of stay afloat and kind of keep your head above water number two to get hold of coke you have to kind of get you know you have to get friendly with some very unscrupulous people right to expose yourself to a world that you probably don't want to be exposed to cool then number three in order to kind of keep that job you're having to sniff this stuff right that's illegal that you shouldn't be doing in your workplace that isn't proper and if you know if your job found out they'll probably fire you on the spot but that's a common cycle. So it's kind of feeding into each other. And then on the end of it, there is no place to go to and escape and have a good time and just sit in a bar until 4 a.m. because every place closes at 12. So you're heading home, um, still juiced up, still pumped and ready to go at 12 p.m. Nowhere to go. You go pick up some expensive Coke that probably isn't Coke anyway, mixed with other sort of shit. And then, you know, it just ends up into a whole disaster. So it's a, it's, it's a cyclical thing. Everyone's sort of involved, right? Everyone's kind of contributing. It's this whole kind of demise and in kind of work-life balance and working standards and shit. Imagine being a boss and finding out your employees are doing bumps in the toilet. Like, you're paying them to get high. Like, it's an impo- just an impossible position to be in. Um, anyway, there, so the friends decided to uh, analyze sewage water. The results um, showed that it was a 30% increase on the weekends. Researcher Leon Barron said, this is in contrast to other cities where they see a very marked recreational use at the weekend. And so cocaine is an everyday drug in London. Wow. London's daily cocaine market is worth an estimated 2.7 million. Um, a gram costs about 40 pounds. That's probably not true. Experts say the priority has increased more. I think... Uh, Coke for the most part, or drugs for the most part, are more expensive in London than they are anywhere else because there's such a big demand for them and it's such, there's such scarcity of actual good products for the most part. I know for that, judging by what people tell me anyway, um, 
it's hard to get really good stuff. So when you do get good stuff and the person knows they've got good stuff, they'll charge a premium premium for it because they know they're going to be able to get it because they know that you know as a user, you can get that good stuff from that person. I kind of equated to my haircut. There was a time when I was going to Stanmore to get my fades, right? From that place called F of Fade. It was a really cool place. All the footballers went there for a period of time. But then, you know, I had to stop going because it's a fucking Ealing Broadway. So it's just, it got, it got a bit too much. Um, but I was willing to go to Ealing Broadway and pay £25, pound, however much it was, to get a haircut because I knew I was going to get the best haircut that I would ever get in my, you know, in my life at this place. Um, so if you kind of extrapolate that and apply that to stuff like drugs, which are, you know, more addicted than getting a haircut, you know, I can do without getting one for a couple of weeks, then I'm not surprised that people will go to those kind of lengths. But I don't think £40 pound is right from my experience. Um, blah, blah, blah. Lawrence Gibbons, the head of um, uh, drugs, threats of the National Crime Agency, said, I think people don't want to go back to 10 years when purity on the street level was down to 3 or 5%. Wow, that's mad. Last month, the Office of National Security revealed that there were three, six, 637 deaths from cocaine overdose last year. Up to, up by, imagine dying from cocaine overdose. How much cocaine are you doing? That's what I always wonder. You have to, cocaine's a weird drug to get addicted to or to have an addiction of because it, it costs so much right other things like heroin it's interesting because stuff like heroin the really bad stuff right is really cheap to get right you can get heroin for pretty cheap alcohol is obviously readily available in most places um for cheap as well but to be addicted to cocaine you have to you just have to have a you have to earn a lot of money in it or not just not pay anything else just completely live a life of a monk right and not buy any other worldly possessions and just funnel funnel all your all your money to eight balls but it's a very expensive addiction to have i don't know how people actually do it to be honest um no idea um it continues last month the office of national security revealed the, the the met commissioner Dwayne creston dick has blamed middle class cocaine users for fueling the drug trade and the co- capital's knife and gun crime that's just insane right an insane assertion to make. Messi kind of said that drugs are a key driver for the level of violence on the streets. Not really. The level of violence on the streets only really occurs when drugs are low, right? When there's a drought. When they do all those busts and they stop dealers from getting their supply, um, deaths kind of, you know, body start to fall straight away because people have to kind of readjust their balance, drag some a product from their rival gang, reassert their dominance, whatever it may be. But those usually happen on the back of droughts and on the back of um authorities kind of seizing um drugs that come in from the poor or seizing big smuggling rings whatever it may be it's not because middle class drug users are using it. that makes no sense if anything if there was more relaxed drug laws around those kind of things especially maybe around middle class um, um users m- maybe the stuff on the street wouldn't be as bad but the stuff on the street has nothing to do with that most has to do with the government not funding or not putting money back into local councils to have like summer schools like i had youth centers are closing left right and center kids don't have areas to really congregate and hang out anymore they don't have it i see in Stratford all the time kids hanging out in weird sketchy dark spots where they can't be seen because they don't have areas to go and hang out and just be themselves it doesn't really exist which is why you probably see so many kids in westville Stratford, you know from wednesday to saturday or walking around aimlessly not doing anything because they've got nowhere else to go where else can they go right it's just such a shit thing and you're blaming middle class cocaine users in labor grove it makes no sense um, anyway, Khan said, recreational drug use is not a victimless crime and anyone purchasing legal drugs should be under no illusions that the horrific expectations of the city supply chain. <laughs> oh, shut up. Tony Sagers, an NCAA former drug um, threat, told Sky News, I would say London has got to a point of market saturation. The demand has gone up. The price has stayed stable. People are able to lay their heads uh, hands on it freely but other cities are catching up the saturation explains why gangs have turned to country lines networks to export the drugs to professional towns okay that's very, very true that's what um supposedly um what's his name asco got caught um within it right um transporting drugs through country lines so like basically going going to country taking your drugs and exporting it into different towns that don't really have the same amount of supply uh, for it but have a high demand um and obviously people you know that don't have much to do have a lot of free time have money to burn you know, when you're bored and have money to burn and you're an adult, the first thing you're going to do is turn to those kind of illicit activities. But yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised about London being the number one place. I think anyone that's been to Shoreditch and Old Tree and seen a whole bevy of lads in tight jumpers, you know, um, <laughs> um, standing around buying cocaine will know that, that that thing is true, obviously. Well, why is it? Oh, come on. Why do we do that sometimes with a screen? Let me take this off somehow. How am I going to do this display capture? No. Boom. Okay, cool. Anyway, we're back. We're back. So, don't know why it's doing this. I don't know why it won't allow me to switch screens. Hopefully, I can switch screens now. Nope. Can I switch screens now? Nope. Okay, I have to change it myself one by one. But yeah. 
I love this thing sometimes, don't I? It doesn't sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I don't know why it does that sometimes. I have no idea. But anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. Um, what do we have here? We have Dr. Rubenstein. Um, real cool interview again. You know, you know my, my thoughts on Dr. Rubenstein. I'm a big fan of hers ever since I saw her play at Mixed Garage, kind of all the a few places here and there. Otherwise, but again, my kind of DJ, somebody that really enjoys um getting on it having a good time chilling out with friends and just being a dj dj right um there's a lot of people out there especially djs why is that kind of a little bit stale a little bit dry don't really have any fun um don't seem like they're because it, it, in general it feels that to me have being a dj or those kind of things are that's a dream job isn't it like being an influencer or something right because essentially you're getting paid to be yourself right you're getting paid to just you know do the things that you do day by day right you like fashion you like wearing weird wacky combination of outfits and someone's willing to pay you for it and sometimes give you some free clothes on top of it right fly you out to fashion week stuff and go to these art basil events like it's a great life same as a dj right some you're obsessed with electronic music, you're obsessed with going out to underground clubs, and suddenly you acquire a taste for selecting good tunes, you get the proficiency to mix songs together, um, you have a good look about you, you market yourself in a good way, and then suddenly clubs around the world are asking you to play weekends on end all around the place. It's a dream job. So I don't really understand some DJs that are able to go up on the, on the decks and just kind of, you know, treat it like some kind of job and just kind of, you know, beat away at the fucking queue and play button and just duck out. I want someone that's going to enjoy and actually um, um, resonate with the experience like it's a one-off experience that you're never, ever going to get ever again in life, right? It's a kind of like a real special, special event that you have going. And I, and I, and I, like, I like that. I'm a big fan of that. Let me see if I can get this up here. The, 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 yeah, there we go. Anyway, so those ribbons down here. I have an interview with Crack Magazine. It's a really cool uh, um, interview. I recommend you check it out. There's a bit on here that I really kind of like that kind of spoke about. It's called um, Dr. Rubenstein is in her element. Um, it says here, people always try to figure me out. Mar Marina Rubenstein claims with a glint in her eye as you show off through Berlin's um, Boxhager Platz neighborhood on an overcast autumn day. I play hard, but I do it with a smile. It's like a game. You think you know me, but you don't. I love that, right? Um, there's something here that I really liked about her that she said here that I'm going to try and get. This is a real good profile of her, good picture. Um, da, 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 graduating school, I'm to Tel Aviv, historic clubs at the block. Da, 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 where is it? I'm going to contemplate becoming a DJ free. Yeah. Um, she ended up playing after that. that one, but not everyone's dancing, not be sitting anymore. Yeah, so this is the one here. So it's a good bit. So Rubenstein contemplating becoming a DJ for three years before acting on it. When a friend who was a manager at Salon Berlin, a, a, a bar in Tel Aviv, asked her to fill in a Monday slot, she was enthusiastically accepted. But then she didn't have any money for records, nor did she know how to mix them, let alone own the equipment. So she ended up playing tunes from her laptop for the 20 people who were at the bar that night. At one point, she just noticed that everyone was dancing. Nobody was sitting anymore. I was speechless. How was this even possible? And that's probably one of the greatest parts of being a dj when you first start especially for me i know um the feeling that you get when you start playing somewhere and it's empty and as people start to congregate around the bar area people start nodding people start like making noises and saying Woo -hoo, or whatever it may be it's such a good feeling because you know you're eliciting that effect by selecting the right tracks and again you're not a musician you're not playing an instrument so it's very hard to kind of glean any sort of satisfaction from the idea that you're mixing these tracks together but the idea that you're able to to, to give them an experience with tracks that they've probably known or they're probably aware of, but you've put them in an interesting combination enough to elicit a reaction, especially for them to dance, to hoot and holler. Like, you just have to pat yourself on the back some because some, sometimes you don't have to do that, right? You don't feel good to kind of jack yourself off, but sometimes in that regard, especially in, when you first start and you're in some shitty bar where no one wants, because I think, I've always said before, right? I think the skill of actually DJing comes from playing in really de um, crappy, weather spoon type bars, and making those people dance because that's just a regular average day consumer right that doesn't really know what they want for the most part and they don't really care about you being there they're just there to have a drink and have a good time get some cheap cocktails and keep it moving so if you can make those people dance i think that's when you're on your way to becoming a real elite dj because if you go play at a hackney warehouse party you go and play in phonics or x or y and no one knows who you are but you're djing well you're gonna play well anyway because so you're gonna make them dance anyway because they've specifically come there to go and have a good time i think joey diaz mentioned it recently in a in a podcast with steve simone recently the, the church of what's happening right now he mentioned something along the lines of like how to you know, part of the reason why they got better as comedians is that they went to bars and clubs where no one wanted them to be there, right? No, no one cared if they were there or not. So you're playing in these bars and nightclubs where, for the most part, the patrons don't know there's going to be comedy on there, right? It's just a normal pub and it's, they didn't know it was comedy now on Wednesday. So you're having to kind of win those kind of people over. But whereas if you're playing, if you're doing comedy or stand-up in an actual comedy club where people actually have to go buy tickets to go see people perform comedy on a Friday, they are mentally prepared for it. It's a different sort of like um, mindset that goes into that. Same with, same with DJing. If no one knows if 
if there's gonna be a DJ in whoever's doing Barca. Like, yeah, I went to Manchester. Manchester bars for some reason have DJs in there, right? And we don't have DJs in Weatherspoon bars here in London. I don't know why. Maybe it's a, a violence thing. I don't know. But um, in Manchester, the Weatherspoon bar I went to to go watch the anti Joshua fight, um, they had DJs playing in there, right? And that was a thing. So imagine, so imagine going in a place like that and not knowing as a DJ. And for instance, they're playing shit tunes or they play good tunes that make you dance. As a DJ, you're going to get satisfaction from it. As a punter, you're going to be like, oh shit, this guy's actually good. He's able to accommodate for all these different interests that are in this room. I think that's a really good point. And let's continue here. Another bit here, also like, along with the two friends, side in the van, what is it? Um, so one bit I really liked about it. Back then, so a few records, you remember, the last tune I played was the control. I uh, have a bit of extreme attitude. So it puts a lot of pressure on me. Yeah, so th th here's a bit I really liked, right? Um, so it's fair to say when Rubenstein sets her mind to something, she commits herself fully. I have an all or nothing attitude, which is, to be honest, a bit extreme. It puts a lot of pressure on you, um, she admits. When she was still living in Tel Aviv, she got into film. She would force herself to watch one film a day, viewing a, a one of viewing of every single um, um, Inga, um, sorry, Ing, Ingmar, um Bergman and Jim Jim Jum Jumask, how you pronounce that, David Lynch film. Um these were uh, her icons of the film world. I wanted to be a director and I used to sneak into lectures and classes into film and TV factory to try and learn as much as possible. Her discipline approached um to learning about movies was not a dissimilar approach to crate digging. When she first moved to Berlin, Rubenstein didn't have a job and would spend hours at the space hall in Kreuzberg digging for special tunes. Her record collection grew very slowly, but only two or three records each time. Back then there wasn't much money left over after playing rent and bills. I couldn't even afford train tickets. I was running for away from the BBG controllers for in his bright pink neon coat like see you never for 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 Rubenstein pouring over records into um hours into refining her DJ skills was paramount to account for the fact that she didn't produce her own music I needed to educate myself um somehow and learn about music so I would just go to record stores take the whole crate of a certain label and listen to one by one I would listen to everything that's how you learn and discover things that's something that kind of got me thinking as a lesson I'm going to attribute because at the moment I'm not producing I think I will get to a point where I have to produce anyway because I think for the most part in most DJ circles it's a fairly common thing or it's fairly well known that in order for you to become a in order for you to become a successful DJ or to get more bookings or to be to get better exposure, you have to produce, right? Because the production, um, there is a shortage of good tunes out there, I think. There's a lot of people making tunes. Whereas, yeah, I think DJ-wise is different. I think there's probably a lot of DJs out there. There's probably more DJs and opportunities. There's probably a lot of good DJs out there, like similar to me, who are operating on a like, kind of a bar level, who are good enough to play in like, you know, Phonics or Nexo Wire, but it's not enough spaces for us to go and play there, right? Because there's only so many DJs that can play there in those kind of events because there's a village of them. But I think there's probably a lack of actual good producers, so, which is why people say if you make a tune, it will probably blow you up quicker than actually honing your craft as a DJ because one tune can get played by one DJ and people automatically, especially the electronic music scene for the most part, if they, maybe music in general, it's how producers get famous too. When they figure out you're the person that made that tune. They'll want you to play. And if they figure out you're a good DJ, it can kind of cascade and kind of roll into other things, um, other opportunities down the line. But it's very hard, obviously, to make tunes, right? It's probably harder to be a proficient DJ. It's probably harder to be a proficient producer than to be a proficient DJ. But in order to become a very proficient DJ, you have to have a very, um, um, you have to have a very obsessive, compulsive um, attitude towards it. The same way you would be as a producer, right? You'd be obsessing over a hi hat or a snare. In the same way, you have to obsess about you know transitions, about themes. I listened, I listened recently to this podcast with DJ talking about how um, in the Chicago scene there were some DJs that were known for um, their mixing skills, where they were able to kind of blend certain vocals. So they'd play like if there was a song about sexual liberation, they wouldn't play it. They wouldn't play a song about sexual liberation next to a song about I don't know misogyny. It'd be it would be songs that kind of had some sort of link towards it, right? Sexual, sexual liberation, a song about being single, um, a song about empowerment, a song about not taking shit. They'll have like a link that links all the songs together. And I thought that was a really clever thing to do. Sometimes I'd never really think of or the idea that I think DJ Harvey spoke about in his, in his interview, the idea that you wouldn't play Get Down Saturday Night on a Friday night, right? You'd have to play these songs on the day they're on. I've, I've kind of done it myself, right? I try and have the songs kind of like line up um, based on the place that i'm in the environment i'm in all these kind of things kind of add to the whole allure of it but 
again i think the way to kind of separate yourself i think as a selector is to get really obsessive and just listen to everything that's what i try and do now i listen to absolutely everything i select the stuff that i like i include it into my sets i try and make it work and just go from there really i think that's probably the best way to kind of do things but again it's hard to do it's very difficult especially nowadays with people making it on the back of you know maybe images or maybe you know gender quotas and stuff and all that malarkey but i think in the long run after this whole kind of you know social media kind of um push has kind of died down essentially like like all things right there's going to be a scene there's going to be a, a, a space for people that just come up on social to kind of get famous and to kind of get um um notoriety that way that's always going to exist but i think in the long run um djs that are good at what they do will prosper will prosper anyway in general because you're really good at what you can do right you can play a fucking you know uh porsche um launch or something some big corporate gig you can play in some basement bar somewhere in berlin and you can play at a main stage um at a big festival like junction two those are all skills that are really kind of suited to kind of the top of the line djs whereas if you're just used to playing banger sets one hour after an hour you know just like all the best kind of top 10 or top 15 songs sold on beatport it's not really that's not really what djs is about djs is about taking kind of a b-side a track that you've forgotten about a track that you haven't remembered and kind of including it and making it work in that regard but yeah really cool interview with dr rubenstein recommend you check it out it's on crack magazine right now um it's titled dr rubenstein is in her element a really cool article again from a dj that i'm a real big fan of i love her approach to music i love her the fact that she's actually a, uh, a raver uh, at heart too um she actually goes on a dance and dances which i kind of like as well um the the, the what is it the bit on here that says she actually dances where is it hey, check, check out yourself you'll see anyway it's 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 a big it's a big article i'm a big fan of it and i'm a big fan of hers next on the list what we have here i hate this thing is not working in it? it's so annoying the screen switch i thought i wonder why that happened why does that happen sometimes usually it works and that's not working at all so because I'm trying to switch screens and trying to do that stuff, but it's not really allowing me to do it. So I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know. Suddenly, it just stops working on this OBS stuff. I don't know if it's me and what I've done personally from it, but I don't know. It's just not working. It's not working anymore, man. Come on. Yeah, it's not working at all. It's not working. I don't know why it's not working. Look, one, two, one, two. Yeah, nothing's working here. I wonder why that's happening. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, there's also a really cool Dr. Um, DJ Harvey interview here. That will, I'll kind of read it to you guys as well. Because, you know, again, like I mentioned, this screen thing is not working the way I want. I intended it to work. I'm not sure why, but maybe because I've saved too many things on here at the same time. But let's just quickly run through this DJ Harvey interview. A really cool interview about, sac uh, I think maybe because I've been listening to this book called Civilized to Death uh written by christopher ryan who has a really really cool podcast recommend you check it out called tangentially speaking he's got a new book out called civilized to death which i'll put here on the screen for you to check out here doesn't play don't play it cool yeah this one here you see that civilized to death by christopher ryan that book there all right you see that you see that you see that yeah it's available now on i think on audible all those kind of things but i've, I've got it on my ibooks i'm probably going to get it in physical copy too it's a really good book it kind of basically his retort to the whole idea behind civilization being the best time ever and you know it's probably a kind of response to um stephen pinker um the book right about what, what was stephen pinker's latest book remember the one he had recently about um how everything's so amazing right it's probably kind of a, quite a good a rebuttal to that i guess this i fall somewhere in the middle right Stephen Pinker's book. What was the latest one he had? Um, not bad. Intentions of our times. Enlightenment now. That's the one. Yeah. Enlightenment now. Um, is the book that Stephen Pinker's got that kind of details his kind of idea. Uh, that we are living in one of the best eras ever. Right. I think that's is that the book is in plan. Yeah, I think it's Enlightenment now. Um, yeah. It's so Enlightenment now is a case of reason, science, and humanism and progress. It's a 2018 book written by Canadian-American cognitive scientist Stephen Pinker. It argues that the Enlightenment values of reason, science, and humanism have brought progress. Shows our progress with data that health, prosperity, safety, peace, and happiness have tended to rise um, uh, worldwide and explains the cognitive science of why the progress should be appreciated. It's also a follow-up to Pinker's uh, 2011 book, The Better Age of Our Time. And then Civilized to Death which is the one I'm talking about now that kind of links a little bit um, to this um, DJ Harvey interview, is this amazing book here that says the following, Civilized to Death, 
Ryan, uh, Ryan, uh, Christopher Ryan makes the case, makes a claim, sorry, that we should uh, start looking backwards to find our way into a better future. The New York Times bestselling or co for Sex at Dawn explores the ways in which progress has perverted the way we live, how we eat, learn, feel, mate, parent, and communicate, work, and die. So a really cool book in general, right? But this links back to this DJ Harvey interview because he's got a really cool quote here, DJ Harvey, where he sort of mentioned um, the kind of beef he had with his um, ex-wife's mother or something like that, right? Let me see if I can find it. Wife. Yeah, so here's here's a bit that kind of sticks out to me. So it's a really cool article. There's those are cool little um, um, styling bits of bobs of him, like just looking amazing. Of course, you guys are aware that I'm a huge DJ Harvey fan. I've seen him plenty of times. I saw him at um, Love Box. I've seen him at Ministry of Sound. I've seen him at um, Bergheim. I went to Bergheim to go see DJ Harvey play. That was fucking sick. DJ Harvey in the main room at Bergheim. I was standing right at the front, going fucking crazy. Super loved it. Like just one of my one of my one of my DJing heroes. Somebody that kind of beats to their own drum his whole life lifestyle is amazing he's he's two resident advisor exchange interviews are probably hands down one of the most legendary interviews ever he's got some great features online just check him out in general it's like a real a real kind of mercurial legendary um godlike figure within the dj circles because he just does stuff the way he wants to do stuff right just does it in a very peculiar sort of way kind of harkens back to the old paradise garage um dj era where they just play a, a, a whole breadth of music right everything from rock to prog rock to punk music to disco to house to techno he covers all bases marathon sets doesn't brag about it and just kind of carries on and does the job even so so much so that he's made his flipping um booker and kind of handler heidi really famous too she's famous in her own regard don't get me wrong she's kind of come up in the scene and done she'd been instrumental in a lot of parties that were legendary back in the day especially in london and in the states but she he's made even someone like heidi famous right he's got that kind of touch the minor touch that people just want to be associated with him and next to him in any sort of regard anyway great styling shoots of with him wearing some cool stuff in regard right so if you want to check out what some of the stuff he has on um, there's a really cool um, picture here of him wearing a gimp mask with his little chihuahua it looks fucking awesome so just a really cool article but this bit stuck out to me that kind of links back to the whole Sylvester death thing right this is the following um the hype is good for business right so let's let's scroll up a bit here let's read these two paragraphs here um in scrolled since adolescence by iconography of south carolina more sunsets frank zappa and colts uh bassett deja harvey uh, marooned himself in la back in the early aughts by intentionally overstaying his visa which is a legendary story you should definitely check that out he took an uh, he took an apartment near the beach learned to surf in hawaii performed domestically got married and divorced and generally try uh, lived his version of the californian dream when he's not working or surfing bassett says i'm sleeping petting a chihuahua drinking cups of tea and watching vanderpump rules which is you know again that's that, that's something you see a lot with um high performing creatives or high performing individuals they usually have a practice or an uh, entertainment or leisure time that has nothing to do with what they do in their regular day to day life something that can kind of allow them to just turn their brain off and not engage it in that regard so watching stuff like vanderpump rules 90 day fiance um love island big brother i've seen it a very prevalent thing amongst big like you know the the highest performing people they watch really trashy tv there is a real re, like it's allowed you should again let's just to turn up and just chill out and kind of just have some distraction for the eyes and the brain and just kind of like you know because i've watched vanderpump rules and stuff like that and below the deck that kind of reality tv show which is fucking amazing and you, sometimes through the show you kind of already know where it's going to go and you end up thinking about other things right you end up sparking other ideas or thinking about things you want to do in the future it's just it's a really cool way to kind of activate your brain in a weird way some people say like again watching tv every day probably not the best part of it but having the time to kind of unwind and not watch the news and not get bummed out by all that sort of stuff but watch something that just kind of you know is um a really good because those reality TV shows, they do whatever they do really well, right? You might not like the people on the show, but they do what they do really well in terms of an entertaining TV show. And for the most part, it's a very fair exchange. The people on that show want their five minutes of fame. The people that make the show want to exploit, quote unquote, these people in, in order to drive viewership and to make sure that they're staying with the job. So it's a kind of fair kind of marriage in that regard. But anyway, let's continue with the article. Um, it was only after he acquired a green card a few years ago and was once again free to roam the planet that he discovered that his decade-long stateside um, sequestration had stoked global demand for his services, which is true, right? So he ends up going to America, overstaying his visa so much so that he can't leave, right? So he has to stay. Then once he gets his green card, that's five years period kind of pass, the demand and the legend of, of um, Harvey has grown in Europe. People have kind of exchanged these kind of folklore stories and passed these whispers and rumors about him. So that when he finally comes, it's a big deal. I remember there was a tour he kept doing where they were announcing these one-off shows there in the other place and they kept selling out, selling out, selling out, selling out, selling out. And I think recently he did a little collaboration with um, artwork, right? At Free Meals Island or something, some sort of festival. 
he's got huge demand just because again it was kind of self-inflicted he did it by himself but that kind of absence of makes the heart grow fonder happened to dj harvey for sure um at 50, at 50 something, um, DJ Harvey is drawing a new generation of influential admirers among them Berlin based DJ superstar Peggy Goo, who calls him the hero, and Baton uh, Don Virgil Abloh, who's conscripted Harvey to, pay, to play for his uh, fashion week pop ups of his. Yeah, cool. And it, it's, this is the main bit. The hype is good for business, but DJ Harvey remains ambivalent towards ambition. I could work an awful lot harder, he says, be very rich and be very unhappy. I strive for a high standard of living, so once my rent is paid and I can afford sushi now and again, I don't need anything more. That's the key punctuation point, right? That's where we are in society. I think that I've mentioned before previously with the whole cocaine epidemic. Everyone's reached a point where they're trying to reach for more. I remember when I was on the shop floor, I was happy to get £7 an hour, £8 an hour. But then, of course, when the opportunity comes through to be a supervisor and they're paying you a pound more, and you start to figure out all the things that you can buy, you start to reach for the stars. And then that, and then your kind of buying habits and your spending habits and your lifestyle then start to become eight pound lifestyle, eight pound an hour lifestyle, nine pound an hour, ten pound an hour. So, and what ends up happening is that you have to end up, you have to keep a job to end up kind of fulfilling that need that you have on the side, right? And even though if you think back to two or three years ago, you were perfectly fine with seven pounds an hour, right? You were able to make the most out of it. You still went on holidays, you went to festivals, you still bought your pair of trainers here and there, took your girlfriend or boyfriend out for a dinner, like treated your parents or something. Like you were okay, you managed the money you have. And suddenly now, the more money you get, the more things that you have to buy, the more things that you're committed to, the more classes you're going to, just you're just spending more and more and more to fill a hole that is not going to be filled with the possessions. When in general, when you have little to no, um, uh, you have a small nut, as they say in America, right? You have little to no kind of um, obligations. You kind of keep your interests and your hobbies really small and tight. You do the same things again and again and again that bring you a lot of value, a lot of, a lot of kind of happiness. And you just keep it that way. Like for instance, for me, like I've noticed that, you know, going to random club nights every week doesn't do it for me. I want to go to big things and see the big leaders and also I want to have to go to Berlin a couple of times a year. So if if my year um if my year whittled down to maybe going to two concerts and going to Berlin twice, then that would be a successful year for me, right? That would be a good and prosperous social life for me. I don't need to go and chase these other things. Um if I wanted this one jacket from Rick Owens or one jacket from Celine, I buy that one jacket. I don't need to go buy the trousers, the trainers, the this, the that. It's just unnecessary putting all your hopes and dreams as one item, you don't get it, and then suddenly now what happens? So and it continues, right? Um uh, I'm a I'm not what I call a zero collector. Someone who looks in their bank and sees another zero and feels good about themselves. I had a heated discussion with my ex-wife's mother once, and I had to explain to her that what she considers success, I consider failure, which is true, right? It's a common adage. I think in Tim Ferriss' four-hour work week story, he's got this story about this uh, fisherman somewhere in a Caribbean island, and he's fishing, and he's got a small little operation where he kind of brings in fish. Um, sells it in a market fresh or is able to barbecue it on the side of the beach for um, tourists. Um, he makes a decent amount of money, clocks off at like 3 p.m., hangs out with his friends, has a beer and a siesta and goes home to his wife and family, right? And then a, a high-flying business executive comes around and sees his little operation of him and says, oh, wow, it's amazing. You're getting this fresh fish. You're barbecuing right here on the beach. You're serving all these customers. You could be making so much more money, right? You could expand your operation. You could license your thing. You could hire more boats. And he's, he's really kind of giving this entrepreneurial thing. And at the end of it, I think the fisherman goes something along the lines of like, yeah, but if I did all that, then I wouldn't. I wouldn't be enjoy my life, right? I wouldn't have the time to hang out with my wife and pick up my kids from school or whatever it may be. So he's kind of engineered his life where he just needs the bare minimum to be covered, right? The rent, the bills, um, I don't know, maybe the, the fee for his kid to go to school, um, the ability to take his wife out for dinner or dates here and there. He doesn't need anything more than that. That's what most of his nut covered, the ability to buy some beers with his friends. That's his nut covered. He doesn't need anything more. The moment he starts to add more things to it, the more he starts to kind of aim for the stars or reach for things that are outside his budget is a moment then you start in, in theory to become enslaved by your work. And that's what happened. To, and that's the, the theme that since happened to civilized to death, right? The idea that, you know, is, uh, is, the, is, uh, is your dog, are we pets to our dogs or are, are the dogs masters to us? Are, like, are we serving the dog or is the dog serving us? Same sort of thing happens in work life, right? It's like, is the job serving you or are you serving a job? Are you kind of um, hooked to it? Golden handcuffs because they're paying you a high salary for a job that you know you shouldn't be getting paid that high for, right? Social media manager is a kind of good example. And there's no there's no job I've had so far, apart from social media manager, maybe really question if I should, if I, if I, it may be really guilty about the money I was receiving because, you know, for the most part, you're just posting on social media. Is that really a job that requires you to get paid, you know, upwards of 27 grand a year, a year really, right? And you're having to fill 
up seven hours, eight hours of your day posting on social media, which is a pretty easy thing to do. So the fact that those things happen is um, um, kind of an example of why you should allow yourself to have as little to no distractions or outside things that are kind of allowing you to kind of stay in a job just because you have to pay for them, right? If you're there because you love the job that you're doing, cool, fair enough. But the fact that you're just there just to make sure that you're able to pay for that, you know, car lease or you're able to go on these fancy holidays isn't a way to go full. You have to kind of I, kind of whittle down your, your the things that you need that kind of bring you happiness and just kind of do the bare minimum to kind of get those covered. And everything else on top is a bonus, but not trying, you know, do as much as you can spend everything you can to fill a hole that is never going to be filled and i think this article from dj Hub, especially nowadays in the, in the era of superstar djs earning a high amount of money from the gigs that they're playing really kind of hits home for me and kind of hopefully you serve as a good example for the djs coming up going forward but yeah i recommend you check it out it's a really cool article it's by um it's, it's on gq uh, magazine a real a real good article with him it's called the dude of global disco dj harvey um real good little styling tips on there do for the old gentleman as well if you want to look a bit interesting out there if you're over 40 which i'm not okay i'm not but yeah really cool article really recommend you check it out i'll link in the show notes again for you guys to see the dude of the global disco an article on gq style okay that's it the screen is going a bit wonky at the moment so i'm going to stop for now Thanks so much for tuning in to Action Zinger Show, episode number 235. As always, check out all my links on my website, actionzinger.com, which you can find in the show note descriptions. If you're watching via YouTube for the first time, give me a like, give me a subscribe if you want to come back again. I have any questions about what I'm talking about, you like some of the topics I'm mentioning, want to leave me a comment and let me know. I'll put some clips up as well on my channel so you can find all these little clips that I've taken from my other pod- from my other podcast episodes if you're not um, ready or willing yet to listen to me for an hour to ramble because I haven't earned your trust or whatever no problem let's watch my clips they're all available there and if you listen via the podcast i believe me a five-star review and so everyone can find out about the show share it if you can all that malarkey if you want this podcast to continue on me to buy more equipment better equipment better mic you're like oh i see your mic is shit your camera is shit okay if you want that to happen help me out contribute to the patreon link is available in the show notes description follow me on the socials and i'll see you again tomorrow for an episode of the show take care and be well my friends bye